And again, welcome. Um, we are here today to talk about South River Ecosystem Restoration Project and South River Ecosystem Resilience. Um, our agenda for the next uh, hour or so is to uh, talk about uh, a project shaped up um, about three or four years ago uh, to address issues of resilience and habitat or ecological connectivity in uh, the landscape of South River bordering um, the borough of Saraville and South River. So we'll hear um, today um, an update from Nick Tafaro with Middlesex County. Um, we'll hear from LRWP board member Johnny Kispe as he provides a general overview of the project. Um, and uh, Christiana Pollock with Princeton Hydro will then jump in for uh, a pretty in-depth uh, orientation of the South River Ecosystem Restoration Project work that Princeton Hydro has spearheaded for the last year and a half or so as part of a National Fish and Wildlife Federation grant. Um, we'll have uh, time for um, Q&A. Uh, we'll have a series of Mentimeter uh, questions for you all. And we'll um, then conclude sort of with a, a summary um, you know, set of um, you know, thoughts uh, to, to close out. So um, if you want to advance through the slides. So I'm Heather Fennick. I'm the board president of the Lower Raritan Watershed Partnership. Um, we also have Johnny Kispe, um, another board member for the LRWP. Um, Johnny is a recently minted PhD uh, through the Rutgers Graduate Program of Ecology and Evolution. And uh, we really would not be uh, you know, where we are with this project if it were not for Johnny. You know, so this was a cornerstone piece of his uh, PhD doctoral research. Um, uh, looking at the South River ecosystem and resilience aspects of that. And he has shepherded uh, this project through um, grant seeking and you know, through grant rollout for uh, the engineer design work that, that has been done to date. So we also have Nick Tafaro. Um, Nick is a principal planner and landscape architect, as well as a certified fl floodplain manager with the Middlesex County Office of Planning. And we have um, from Princeton Hydro, Christiana Pollock. Um, Christiana is a ecologist and GIS specialist um, who has really brought a big picture vision to um, you know, how to take uh, the concept you know, work that's been done and make that a reality around uh, this project. So um, also on, on today, I want to say a big thanks to Jessica Jerry, um, who has, has done also some behind the scenes work for us on, on this project. So huge thanks to Jessica. Um, Okay, so um, for um, just the, the sake of understanding the community, the watershed community, if you could use the chat feature in the lower right hand corner, um, tell us your name, your affiliation, and um, give us a sense of uh, why you are interested in this project and in ecosystem restoration. Um, and what does resilience mean to you? So I'm going to give you just a, a minute to um, you know, provide us with some of that information in the chat box. And uh, while that is, uh, while folks are, are typing in their answers, um, Nick, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, tell tell us what interests you about this project and what oh, resilience means to you. I didn't expect this question. My goodness. I uh, well, for me, this project is pretty much a a, a, a case study and a centerpiece for what we can do uh, to ecologically restore 
And am I am I echoing on you? A, a little bit, Nick. So if you just want to give us a, a quick you know, minute yeah. summary and then and then we'll put you back on mute for a minute so that we avoid the echo. Okay. Um, putting it succinctly, this becomes a, a an example of how we can restore uh, degraded sites that are throughout the Raritan corridor. Great. Okay. Right, the the opportunity to restore some of the historically um, you know, neglected or degraded spaces, I think, is a motivator for a lot of folks who are joining us. Um, so, uh, some of the comments in the text box, you know, we have um, a local birder who has spent a lot of time at the property. You know, obviously, someone who's interested in the ecological piece of things, um, habitat restoration. Um, Another individual who is um, uh, interested in how this project might affect the community in Dehernal, Dehernal Lake, which is um, adjacent um, part of the, the watershed. Um, we have uh, someone from the Sayreville Environmental Commission um, interested in the flood control aspects of, of um, possible flood control aspects of, of this project. Ecosystem restoration and water quality improvement potential, um, and uh, the comment here regarding resilience um, uh, is uh, for for this person um, the ability to overcome obstacles or thrive through potential setbacks. Great. Um, other comments here um, regarding supporting local New Jersey wildlife rehabilitation with soft releases in ecologically preserved areas, which is just a really interesting. There's there's so many layers of um, you know, sort of uh, in, interesting potential with that answer. Um, and yeah, um, Jens Riddell with the Central Jersey Stream Team, yeah, sort of kind of a, a Stone comment, you know, always interested in ecosystem restoration, which I think all of us are. Um, great. Um, resilience here means coming back more capable of resisting adversity. Yeah, you know, so certainly our lower Raritan watershed, our Raritan River, our South River have um, suffered uh, a, a lot of um, adverse impacts with. Uh, a number of flood events, storm events over the years. Um, our habitat has been degraded through uh, you know, industrial uses. And you know, those are some of the, the ways that we want to uh, sort of advance resilience is so that we can address some of those, those aspects. So um, great, thank you. I think I have all of the comments here. Um, we wanna move forward. Okay. So just a, a little bit about the project. So um, in 2019, um, well, actually starting in 2018, Johnny uh, worked with folks at Rutgers University to develop um, a grant proposal for this project for submission to the National Fish and Wildlife Federation. Um, the grant was designed to meet 60% design standards for a restoration project, an ecosystem restoration of the South River. Um, this grant is coming to a close. Um, I think June 1 is the, the um, grant report out date. Um, the grant should, the report should be completed at that point. Um, and the idea is to then move uh, into the next stage of completing the uh, additional 40% design so that we can move toward um, basically you know, shovel ready status and begin implementation. Um, so uh, the, again, the report for this grant should be out June 1. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, at the end of the session. Okay. Johnny, I guess uh, this is you next. Great. Uh, thanks, Heather, for that introduction and uh, welcome everyone again. Uh, so for the, what we want to make uh, the use of this time here is to really focus in on how we can build resilience throughout the Raritan River and Raritan River region 
uh, and more broadly, the Lower Raritan watershed uh, through uh, regional and ecological connectivity. And so what that means, uh, and that can mean a number of different things, uh, you know, utilizing, uh, utilizing uh, nature-based solutions to create uh, ways to connect uh, ecosystems and uh, reduce some impacts from uh, rising sea level um, and some, uh, you know, some flooding that can happen uh, to municipalities along the way. And um, to, to start us off, we're going to have uh, Nick Tafaro give us a little bit of an overview from the county's perspective. So uh, Middlesex County has been uh, taking a number of uh, leading a number of efforts to uh, really bolster the resilience of the county. So uh, Nick, please go ahead. Okay. Um, um, so, first so first of all, of all um, the, the Office of Planning, Planning at, Middle at Middlesex County, County has, has really, really been, been re recreating itself uh, over, the, over the last two years with new leadership, leadership and, and, um, and, 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 and at, at the same, same time attempting to carry, carry through on, on the innovative, innovative programs that, that we started, started uh, four new four leadership, leadership came in. And one and of those, those is Destination, Destination 2040, 2040, which is our update to our, our county-wide master plan. plan. And uh, our activity on that is really uh, fast and furious right, right, right now. now. And, and we hope to be coming out with uh, public meetings on uh, our functional plans, which involve open space, transportation, uh, what's called a zero vision actions to uh, reduce uh, pedestrian uh, accidents and injuries and um, our resiliency efforts. Uh, as a matter of fact, as part of the change, I have been designated the resiliency planner in Middlesex County. And uh, I also coordinate for the um, uh, floodplain managers of the county as a CFM. And uh, that led to the uh, the townships of the Raritan River and Bay communities uh, coming to us and say, we want to do the uh, Resilient New Jersey regional project uh, that we uh, were awarded in 2020. And uh, that is actively going on now and involves, if you look to the far uh, right on the slide, you'll see the municipalities that have joined together to address floodplain issues and uh, climate change and sea level rise in that area of the county at the mouth of the Raritan River. Uh, this is another uh, model much larger than our South River project that we hope to uh, use the protocols to move from watershed to watershed and create a plan for long range improvements uh, throughout uh, the county regarding stormwater and uh, natural resources. Uh, the other thing that's very important to all this and is connected in is the hazard mitigation plans and their updates. Every five years, there's a hazard mitigation plan update to direct actions for the next five years. We've just had the 2020-25 plan approved. And as you can see, this is a version uh, all the way to the left, you see the cover page from our 2015 document. And as you can see behind it, each municipality is uh has a set has a separate chapter with risk assignments and uh actually flood uh potential areas shown and so what we are doing with the uh this is an example but what we're doing is we're coordinating all the background information so that each of these project types and studies and our long-range policy planning is based on fact, is based on evidence, is uh, decisions based on real world uh, observation. And this project is going to show us what to do 
with that real world observation in terms of ecological restoration, as well as a balance of community co participation in these uh, open space areas. And that's it for me. Thanks, Nick. Uh, so leading into uh, the Raritan River and Resilience, the Lower, uh, the lower Raritan Watershed Partnership um, while work while works throughout the whole watershed does recognize the you know the importance and the vulnerability of many of the municipalities along the Raritan Bay and Raritan River region and one of the main uh, uh, current upcoming threats is uh, sea level rise and what we have here in this figure uh, is showing two potential uh, uh, projections for sea level so sea level rise so in the top one you see about 1.4 feet of sea level rise which is about the 50 percent, um, the 50 percent, or the likely estimate, and what's missing here is that this is for 2050, and then we have the on the bottom figure, uh, two foot of sea level rise, which is the five percent, the more extreme, so still a little, uh, rather unlikely. Uh, but these two figures here are presented side by side, so that we can understand the uh, potential impact that a rise of sea level can have along our um, Raritan River communities. So. Just to orient uh, everyone, uh, although I suspect many are uh, familiar, sure. Uh, um, well, uh, so the, talking about uh, continuing on uh, the Raritan River and resilience. Uh, on the left here, we have a figure from Hurricane Ida, and so a lot of flooding that occurred along Route 18. So if we start thinking about resilience along the Raritan River, it's not only our ecosystems that are at risk, but also our built infrastructure in our communities, our highways, our uh, critical infrastructure, roads, uh, utilities. And so as we continue to move forth and uh, consider what resilience looks like in the lower Raritan watershed, we can start, we, we need to incorpor incorporate how we think about these systems and what steps we can use, uh, we can take to incorporate nature-based solutions to uh, really bolster the resiliency of, of our community, um, of our communities along within the watershed. And to the right here, we have again, just the, uh, wanna also note the importance of taking regional approaches that include uh, municipalities across the board to come together, to think, to plan together, to work together and strategize, but how we can use um, uh, uh, you, and leverage uh, resources across the board to come up with more holistic uh, plans that can uh, really uh, uh, maximize the effects of up upcoming projects and planning efforts uh, so that um, all, all, uh, all communities are included in the process. Next. And that brings us to our project goals. Uh, we have three main goals that this project looks to address. The first is to reduce socioeconomic damages to the boroughs of South River and Sayreville, which are caused and have been, and, and have uh, historically caused stor uh, storm damage, flooding, um, and thinking forward and ahead, sea level rise. What are the potential uh, impacts that uh, sea level rise can have uh, from a socioeconomic perspective? The second is to, to transform degraded wetlands to high quality marsh. This is again, focusing on that ecological connectivity, uh, creating a habitat that is important to local and migratory flora and fauna um, to, to really emphasize on, on that quality portion there uh, while providing uh, uh, a benefit of the reduction in flooding uh, at the same time. So we have again, dual goals that we can achieve there. And lastly, is engaging stakeholders and activities about coastal resilience and ecological health. Uh, efforts such as this, uh, you know, and others uh, through uh, LRWP's newsletter and postings, we seek to really engage folks within the communities that these kind of problems affect and uh, really have a community and uh, part a participatory process throughout the whole way. And uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. So to give everyone an, uh, just a little brief overview of the project area, some of you may be familiar, for some of you, this may be back your backyard. Uh, this is the project area um, along, uh, uh, along Sayreville and South River. Uh, what you see, the body of water cutting across the project area is the, Was is the Washington Canal, and that connects the, the Raritan River to the South River. 
Uh, so just to give you guys, and so it's it's landscaped here, but that big uh, kind of just uh, angled uh, water body, that's the Washington Canal there. And that was, uh, that was created uh, his, uh, historically to allow for ease of access of goods and materials in and out from the South River out to the Raritan, uh, to Raritan River, eventually out to the Bay where it, it would then be transported to places like New York City or other, uh, other areas um, afterwards. I'll go next slide, please. So site history, uh, just wanted to bring this up. So in the left, you have an old uh, tax map, that, um, a parcel map uh, that uh, in the red circle shows where the project area lies. Uh, so again, very different shape. You can see there the, the river, uh, the sinuosity of the river was a little different. So how curved it is, uh, but also the wash, you know, and so, um, but that also leads to the importance of this, of this part here, right? So we have a brick to the, uh, on the right here, on the right of the slide. And that brick represents the industry and the history of Sayreville and the neighboring locations as a hub for uh, the production of bricks. Uh, this port, this part of of the state does have very rich clay pits, and so um, that was uh, a source of industry uh, back in the eighteen or in the mid eighteen hundreds, so the eighteen fifties, uh, when uh, the um, James Sayer first founded uh, Sayer and Fish, um, and that continued up on uh, those that kind of industry continued up until the nineteen seventies. Um, there was also glass that was exported out of here, out, out of this region. So it was a very, uh, very industrial um, part of the state. In the bottom right figure, what we have there is uh, some cargo being loaded onto a ship, uh, onto a small vessel, then that would be then carried out through the Raritan. Uh, they were loading bricks. So this port, this area was, you know, used to load bricks, uh, to lay bricks out to dry. Um, and a lot of that history is still visible on the project area itself today. Um, on many site walks and visits that I've uh, gone over the years, uh, you always find a, a different brick somewhere, or like a collection of bricks. So there's, there's a really rich history to, to the site here. Uh, next slide, please. And that'll lead us to our uh, project update. Uh, where we uh, will have um, a little bit of an orientation as to where, uh, as to the project itself that we're completing. But before then, what we'll do is we're going to, uh, um, if we can go to menti.com, uh, you can use your phone, your tablet, or even if you're on your computer, open up a new tab and, you know, um, on your browser. And so I'll give you all a minute for that. Uh, when you enter to menti.com, it's going to give you an option to submit a code. And so the code, the eight digit code on the bottom is the code that you input in there. And what this, this tool is going to allow us to do is to be able to, to be able to have some sort of interaction um, through, throughout the, the presentation here, just as a, uh, you know, just to let you know, your answers are anonymous and, you know, the, you know, so you don't need to worry about that if, if you are. And so our first question is have you ever been to this? Have you ever been to this site? For many of you that uh, perhaps have lived around the area for a while, maybe you've uh, walked around it or you've heard about it or you've seen it. Um, for those that you know spend a lot of time at the water or belong to one of the boat clubs on the South River, uh, on the boat club to the South River, you may have passed by it or you've paddled by it if you're an avid kayaker in the location. So I'll give us about a minute or so, and then we'll we'll see uh, what uh, responses we get. If you have any difficulties accessing the Mentimeter, please uh, let us know via chat. Uh, thank you, Jessica, for uh, inputting the, the code on there. So right now, it seems like a, we have about a 67% so of folks have not, um, and have not been to the site. We have some that have uh, yes on land and yes uh, boating pad, by boater paddling. So th this tends to be uh, a little bit of the response I've, re I've seen uh, when talking to others about, about the project area. You know, for some, it's kind of just like, oh yeah, it's there, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, but they haven't really been on and on the site itself. And uh, so that, that, that confirms some of our, our previous experience. How about 15 seconds more and then we'll move on to the next.
All right. Uh, the, ne the next uh, poll we have here is what wildlife have you seen or would you expect to see around the site? Now, I understand that many of you have not been to the site as, as, uh, as your um, uh, previous poll indicates, uh, but if you, you know, were to imagine what you would see if you're, you know, along the site, what kind of, what, what would you probably see or uh, hope to see maybe even? So our first two answers, we have, uh, we have Osprey coming in. Yes, the Raritan River has completely transformed over the past decade and Osprey, uh, uh, nesting Osprey have increased along the Raritan. Uh, have seen many Osprey there myself, bald eagles. Again, there's a nesting pair right across the river um, by, the, by the power lines uh, across Sayreville. And, one, and um, so I, I've seen those and they've actually got a, a uh, a fledgling, well, at this point, he's probably about three years old, but that, that's um, uh, definitely something I've seen out there. Some migratory birds, for sure. Deer, I have seen traces of deer there. Waterfowl, we do, you know, we are, we do lie within the uh, mid -Atlant the migratory flyway. So during uh, the migratory uh, period, we do have a lot of stopovers in New Jersey, and we tend to see some special uh, migratory uh, birds around here, some uh, sunnies, hawks, some turtles, my boy, uh, some fish, Canada geese. Yes, there's plenty of that. Um, 200 species of birds have been seen there and have also seen deer and usual woodland mammals. Wow, if you've seen all of those on that site, I hope you're recording it somewhere, uh, like iBird or somewhere. We would love to uh, get that list from you, whoever you are. Um, if you wouldn't mind chatting, uh, just uh, I uh, I'm I'm assuming it's probably we had a bird or um, Patrick. If that's you, um, hopefully we can get in touch. And uh, okay, oh Lewis, okay, awesome, thanks. It's on eBird, so we we can see uh, that that data set. That's probably a really rich uh, data set as we move forward, and would love to talk more about you know what what else you see out there. Uh, so thanks everyone for your responses and uh, we're going to keep some of those answers on our end. It helps us understand the, uh, how, how the site is used and how we can best, uh, you know, work to continue to either uh, uh, to enhance the habitat and uh, see some more of, uh, of those things. Um, I want to take a minute, a couple minutes now to uh, give us a project site orientation uh, just to uh, con again, continue to orient everyone as to what the project site looks like today and uh, give a little bit of an overview. So I mentioned earlier uh, that the project site, which in the photo to the right and outlined in red, is along the Washington Canal. As you'll see, it, it, the Washington Canal um, connects the South River, which is uh, the meandering water uh, a piece of the water body on the left here. And it, it connects the uh, Raritan River, which is out of um, um, out of this figure here. But uh, again, just to give you um, the orientation of the project there. Next slide, please. And about two years ago, what we did is we we were able to get um, some really cool drone imagery. And so uh, these are all bird. The the next few fo photos before I show you. Uh, what it looks like on the ground are meant to give you a little bit of a bird's eye view of what the pro what the project area looks like. And so this first one I found really interesting, and um, it, I found it interesting because it gives you a little background as to like what the project site right now is being used for. And what you'll see here are like some trails, and uh, there is heavy um, ATV usage on the project area. Some uh, uh, ATV and motor uh, motorcycle motocross type uh, usage which um, is, is uh, the, one of the main, uh, you know, you'll see it throughout um, the project area, but I want, I, I really, I just wanted to bring to the attention that this is the kind of uh, usage the pro project site is getting uh, nowadays. Next slide, please. This next aerial uh, right here, I wanted to focus on the, the edge. Um, so this is the side that goes along the Washington Canal. And there's two things I want us to focus on here. Well, really three, but um, one, uh, one is on the bottom right part of the aerial. You start, you see some pilings poking out. These are the pilings that were originally uh, installed when the Washington, Washington Canal was being created. And this really is why it had that linear shape. 
uh, that linear uh, form uh, along uh, there. And right next to them, you see some of them are starting to topple over. Uh, there is a lot of erosion that is occurring uh, across uh, this, this side of the project area. And uh, as you move along the edge, you start seeing some cutouts. And those are areas where uh, either part of, um, you know, what used to be uh, marshes are uh, washing away um, time after time as, you know, as you have uh, wakes from boats that come and they create uh, 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 waves that causes some erosion, water velocity, also natural causes such as like the, the um, high tide and low tide can contribute to some of this. But, and um, you'll see this also uh, uh, exacerbated after storms. When you have high flow, um, high, high storms, coastal storms, uh, can really drive uh, drive uh, erosion on edges, and uh, as you move inland, you start seeing a little bit of forest, a uh, little bit of forest dis, uh, foresting. This was uh, done during leaf off conditions, so you can kind of see clearly a little clearly. Um, it was early spring, so everything hadn't uh, bloomed yet, so you can kind of see the ground. Uh, next slide, please. This. And this aerial, so this was taken during a low tide event. So as a, uh, you know, along the Raritan, we have a changing of the tides twice a day. We have two high tides and two low tides. And so this was taken during a low tide uh, event. And what I just wanted to, I wanted to point out two things here, uh, both kind of like the dynamic of the waterway. Uh, as you see uh, where you don't see water, you start to see some mud flat. And you start seeing kind of that transition from water to mud flat to marsh, um, and that mud flat is an extremely productive area for uh, for uh, uh, shorebirds. They use it to feed, and so it's a it's a very important um, uh, eco uh, habitat type. And on the edges, so on the top and on the bottom, there is a, this kind of like grassy type. Uh, Vegetation that you, you're seeing, and so that is um, that is Phragmites australis. Um, it's a, a an invasive uh, grass that has been taking over a lot of our uh, marshes across the state. Uh, if you're ever driving down the turnpike, you'll likely see it lining uh, both sides of the turnpike. It does really well in disturbed areas. Uh, it does really well in freshwater. Um, it does well with some salinity. It's a bit of a nuisance in our in our region, and uh, we're still trying to figure out how to really cope with this invasive species. Next slide, please. This is the last figure um, uh, for the drones that I've put on uh, on this slide, and I just wanted to also remind us that it's not just. Uh, tidal, it's not just uh, wetland, but there is a forested areas here. Um, and in this, in the late spring and summer, it gets really dense uh, in some portions. So uh, it's a very, uh, it's a very different site depending on where you are. So you, you know, the first slide we saw more of that human impact, the human interaction, and then we, you know, I just wanted to kind of guide us through all the different habitat types on the project area. Uh, next, so now we're taking, uh, we're going to go step away from the aerial uh, views and kind of uh, dive into more uh, uh, human perspective, what we see out there. And so the figure in the top left is a uh, figure that was taken out by the Princeton Hydro team while they were doing some uh, necton uh, sampling. So they uh, took the, their time to take these really cool figure uh, picture here and what you see, you see a couple birds enjoying uh, the project area here and um, just, you know, it really, I think, speaks volumes as to the kind of diversity and the kind of activity we have in our watershed. Um, and the figure in the bottom uh, is the pro so on the top right, you see that the project area map and that red dot shows you where I was standing at the type of time of this photo. So it kind of gives you a perspective of, of where it is. And this was taken during, again, a low tide event. So the water level is really low, and this shows you the extent of mud flat that is out there right now. Um, it's just a really good view of what this what this portion of the project area looks like. Uh, next slide, please. This next photo uh, is taken in a little title, like a little channel, 
And uh, what I want you guys to really uh, focus on here is the sides. Again, that I showed that aerial figure of Phragmites from the top down. And now, um, as we're sit, I'm, as I'm sitting in a John boat, you know, you can kind of look to the left and the right, and you can see just the overwhelming amount of Phragmites that is on the project, uh, as that is within the project area. Again, this was during a little bit of a low tide event. So if you see at the bottom of the Phragmites, there's a little bit of exposure, uh, just from the, you know, from the low tide. So this, it's really densely packed. Um, these uh, invasive uh, plants can get uh, up to 12 to 15 feet, so they can get pretty big. Next slide. And in this figure, uh, in this uh, picture here, what you're seeing is uh, a, a native uh, Spartina alterniflora grass, which is a uh, native uh, marsh grass. And uh, you see like little clumps of it starting to kind of uh, form off. And this is called slumping. And uh, we can, and, and as, as uh, you know, uh, storms occur, some of some of these uh, clumps of uh, of marsh essentially will start to wash away. They can wash away over time, and what you're losing there is you start losing the benefit of the marsh. The marsh can provide, uh, you know, so it, it serves as a sponge. It can cause it can provide increase in water quality. Can pr uh, can reduce effects of flooding, and it's also really uh, rich habitat for. Uh, for for species. So again, it has that dual role of, of benefiting not only uh, of environmental benefits, but also socioeconomic benefits. Next. And a, a, just another close view here as you move along the South River, this gives a little closer perspective of uh, some uh, parts of the marsh that were slumping off and closer to the edge. I have revisited this site and this particular location since and Two of those clumps are no longer there, so it's kind of kind of interesting when you see it. You get on the site, you know, uh, pretty regularly. You see the changes that occur um, over time and uh, rather quickly, I would say, like in the in the span of four years. So these are this is something that is occurring today. Next, this and we'll now go into our next uh, mentee. So if you can open up your tab, your phone. A tablet and please go to menti.com if you ever have it ready. Um, the next question should be up there. If you don't, uh, just input the code again. And this question is going to lead us into our next section, uh, but how will climate change affect the site and surrounding system? Using your knowledge of what you know about climate change or don't know about climate change, how do you think that uh, it could affect um, the project area, the surrounding ecosystem, and out, or, or even neighboring, neighboring locations? I'm not seeing any answers come in. Is everybody able to get to this question? Well, yeah, it's like five, uh, five responses. Like we have five got entries. There. Six entries. You're seeing things? No, um, no, but at the bottom right, there's a, it says six that I think that means that six folks have responded. Oh, there we go. User error. Eventually it'll be underwater completely. Water will immerse it. Higher water levels, more frequent storms, flooding and further erosion. Yeah, uh, um, increased pre precipitation will put stormwater flow pressure from land on wetlands, making them even more valuable. It will cause flooding affect the animals. It will simply be flooded out. The salinity will probably rise in the water, pushing out any wildlife that cannot tolerate salinity. Yeah, the I mean, sea level does move the salt wedge up, um, up as sea level continues to rise and flooding. Make the area more submerged, salty, and more erosion. Great. 
Well, thank you all for the, those responses. Shift in bird species as well. Um, and this is a really good segue um, to, you know, thinking about how um, ecological resilience would look like uh, within the project area as well. So we, we've we now talked about how climate change may affect it, but what what do you think, what, what does ecological resilience look like in this project area? I'm just going through the chat real quick. Dana, thank you for providing the uh, eBird link for all the marsh uh, bird, for all the, I'm sorry, for all the bird sightings. So we got answers coming in. Uh, diversity of habitat, native habitat, thriving, Variety of habitats. I'm seeing variety and diversity of habitats is a, a tr uh, common trend here. Uh, marshes, very good. Uh, native. Accretion, definitely. Absorb storm surge. <laughs> We'll give another 30 seconds or so if there are any lingering answers. What do we got? What do we get? I don't, I don't know what got added. Stable banks got added. Uh, stable banks, thank you. Better water quality. Great. Well, thank you all for your responses on that. And I'm going to uh, segue to our next uh, speaker. Uh, Christy is going to uh, take us into the a little bit about the de design of the project area. Thank you, Johnny. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to pick it up where, you know, where you just left off with your question. So, you know, how will climate change affect the surrounding ecosystem? And I'd say everybody's answers were spot on. I mean, it's exactly um, we are thinking's aligned. You know, Johnny showed pictures of shoreline erosion, and we would expect that to be accelerated with increased flows that originate both from river flows and coastal storms. Uh, so this site is sort of special in that it has both riverine and coastal flooding and both types of storm events need to be managed. Um, and some you know, mentioned loss of wetlands and there, you know, as sea level rises, there'll be prolonged inundation on the, the salt marsh. Um, and, and right now sea level rise is outpacing accretion. Uh, so we will see some, some wetland loss as well. There will also be more frequent Flooding. I mean, we talk about sea level rise, but there's also going to be upland flooding. We see that with coastal storm events, um, particularly, you know, Sandy was the last significant surge event that we had in the area. Um, and these, pro, you know, this prolonged inundation stresses the plants. And so not only do they have a prolonged duration of tolerating standing water, but it's also bringing salt water into the system for some plants that were, are primarily attuned to, to a freshwater system. Uh, you know, and as these native species become threatened or stressed, we're going to see more and more invasive species encroaching. Uh, you know, Phragmites is already rampant across the site, and we would expect to see that continue um, as the Phragmites would take advantage of sort of this disturbed ecosystem. Um, you know, without any invasive species plant management, species management, um, you know, in general, we will see native populations being taken over, you know, with or without um, even the prolonged in inundation, just because of the um, sort of the vitality and the vigor of, of invasive, invasive species. And with that, you see a total loss of, of habitats, um, particularly for threatened and endangered species that we would be concerned about in this site. So, like I said, everyone is spot on with your answers. There's a handful of impacts we would expect to see. And it's really sort of framing those impacts that help to um, inform the design and our design objectives. Um, and ultimately, what we want to do is reset the site's trajectory. So right now, it's sort of on this trajectory towards disturbance, and we sort of just want to right the wheel a little bit, um, right the ship um, to go into a more to a more resilient. Uh, 
direction. Um, so what are our, what were our, our and our <laughs> were in our our design objectives? So one is public access and passive recreation opportunities. This is you know this this site belongs to the boroughs and. We want to see the public use it. It also brings stewardship to the area. You know, if people are familiar with the area, enjoy using it. You know, we have people on the, the call today that use the site and are probably passionate about seeing what happens. Um, so creating that stewardship is important. And then transforming those degraded ecological communities to restore a higher quality habitat for fish and wildlife. Uh, and then lastly, creating an adaptable design. Uh, we know the climate's changing, so it's important to design a, a project that, you know, is not only flourish in today's conditions, but also in 100 years. Like, what is the site going to look like? And how does that um, think change? Or excuse me. How does that factor into our thinking? And so what we've, uh, you know, we took these ad design objectives. We thought through, you know, the different climate change impacts and then answering the question that, that Johnny asked, you know, what does ecological resilience look like? And I think, you know, there was a lot of native, a lot of diversity, accretion, and it's exactly, you know, we were thinking the same thing. Um, and so here we have a rendering of the 60% design. Uh, and there you can also see the existing conditions image in the, the top right corner. Uh, so some features that I'll sort of bring your attention to um, is a living shoreline along the linear portion of the site uh, that's adjacent to Washington Canal. This is the area that already has a fair amount of erosion. So we'd be, be using a living shoreline to, shore, to stabilize the shoreline as well as to prevent any further erosion. Uh, and then restoration of degraded habitat. And what does that mean? It usually means eliminating the invasive species and planting native species. Uh, and we have proposed maritime grassland as well as some maritime forest creation uh, as well. And both restoration and creation of tidal wetlands. And you'll see there's some flags there for low marsh and high marsh, as well as maritime scrub shrimp wetlands. So there's a nice diversity of the different marsh communities. Uh, and then a creation of a tidal channel. So this is a pretty big change. <laughs> uh, it's actually sort of ex going through and excavating. Um, a tidal channel that will create this hydrologic connection between the systems. And then even some features for the endangered species. So you see there's an osprey platform sort of in the central part of the site. Um, I'd also envision, you know, the bald eagles probably use this, uh, as people have seen, they use the site and, you know, that maritime forest adjacent to Washington now will leave a lot of perching areas for, for bald eagles and other bird avian species that can um, hunt from, from that area of forage. And then, you know, not but last but not least, those public amenities. You know, what can we bring to the community? Um, you see, we have a pathway and boardwalk system that that really hugs sort of the outside of the the site, and then also there's a path that leads to a fishing access and a kayak stop that's sort of in the left top screen, top image. Um, and that what we envision, you know, we know people are using the site for fishing. There's a lot of evidence of people using the area, and we want to. Uh, we want to facilitate that, you know, we don't want to take these uses away. Um, and then we have what we're calling a kayak stop. Uh, you know, there's sort of grander plans to use the area for kayaks, if there's a blue trail. This is an area where people can visit the stop, visit the site, and then walk around the path. Um, so the site's accessible both. I got so you did the, there you go. <laughs> I was muted. Where? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know where uh, at what point it was muted. But did I did everyone hear the discussion of public amenities? Okay. You, yeah. you got to the boardwalk information. <laughs> What's that, Nick? I just muted Nick. That's who I was trying to mute. Uh, <laughs> you got to the boardwalk piece. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, Do you hear about the kayak and fishing access? Okay. All right. So those pretty. You know, those are the the public amenities. Um, and so you know, we were talking about how the design accommodates a changing a changing climate. Um, so a couple of items I'll bring to your attention. So you'll notice the forest and grassland. Um, we're sort of we're using maritime species. So what does that mean? It's it's really species that are a little more salt tolerant, uh, and will also favor species that can 
perhaps handle maybe a little bit of inundation during storm events. So it's about the plant selection in these areas uh, and making sure that they can accommodate those future conditions. Uh, oh, also, there's room for marsh migration. So marshes will naturally accrete um, and they'll also move towards the upland as sea level rise. And, you know, they do that if they have the space. And so it's about creating the space and the conditions for that marsh to migrate. So we have low marsh and high marsh as well as the scrub shrub wetland. Over time, we'd expect the low marsh to turn into mudflat and the high marsh to convert to low marsh. And then high marsh um, would move would convert from scrub shrub wetland. And then there's even opportunities to move inland. Uh, so it is forward thinking and allowing, allowing the site to adapt as our conditions change. And then I mentioned that tidal channel uh, earlier. So, you know, what, what are the benefits of a tidal channel? And, you know, having these secondary channels, particularly when you have increased flows from the extreme events that we're having, there it's really a refugia for fish. Uh, so it's a, it's, uh, it's a great fishery uh, habitat. And then sort of what it also offers is just great views and it brings wetlands closer to the people um, so they can see what's actually happening. And so if you can go to the next slide. Christy, before I do, we just have one question in the chat that this oh, yeah. um, seems good to answer on, on this slide, but the question is, did you consider the design alternative of filling the Washington Canal and restoring the meander of the original river? That's a great question. I have to say, we did not consider that. Uh, I was, I guess I was under, under the impression that Washington Canal is a navigation channel and probably regulated to some extent. Um, but that would be interesting. I mean, if you look at an aerial, you can see the meander, the big sort of lazy meanders at the South River, and then the Washington Canal just kind of cuts through it. Um, but that's, I'll definitely have to think, give that more thought, especially as projects are looking for places for fill placement. <laughs> and then a second question came in, will there be any access to or through the large maritime forest area? Good question. So our original intent <laughs> is to keep the large maritime area really secluded from humans. Um, and the impact that we bring to those areas. Uh, and that's also in combination with sort of ATVs. You know, what is the best way to, to sort of prohibit ATVs from, from creating pathways and degrading the, the um, habitat? Uh, that's something that, you know, the birders and others would like to see is, is foot access. It's something we can talk about. Uh, you know, how do we create that foot access with and still not allow ATVs to, to access that area. <laughs> Sorry, look at the comments. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and advance the slide. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so here what we're showing is sort of is um, an existing condition. As I say before, sort of existing slash before construction. Um, you can see in the right hand the where we are located in the red dots. We're sort of at this this sharp angle of the site sort of looking in the upland um, and you can see it's pretty it's pretty you know there's some barren there's some grasses it's kind of straggly um, so in our proposed condition it's if you're at that same exact location where your image is now just if you could go to the next slide please uh, this is what it looks like in the proposed conditions so it's very different uh, you have a lot of marshes so we have this pedestrian path and, and the the bridge um, that the people are walking over and looking to their left side that's high marsh and low marsh grasses that we're seeing um, you can also see this sort of low tide that tidal channel will dry up during low tide and then it becomes a mud flat which is a very valuable habitat um, to the area and great for avian species uh, and then there's also the, the coastal forest or maritime forest in the background as well. So going to the next slide, uh, we've sort of positioned the before and after so you can really see that difference um, and vision how the, the site might might look. And it is, you know, there, someone had mentioned a shift in avian species or bird species, and they're certainly correct. They're, you know, we're not, we can't say the exact same species are gonna use it, but the hope is, is that we'll, we'll have a diversity of species along with the diversity of habitats that can bring to bring to the community, bring to the site. 
And I believe, you know, that's sort of, you know, a really snap quick snapshot of our 60% design. Um, but with that, we're going to go to the next Mentimeter. Thanks. Yeah, and and so our next Mentimeter um, is what it asks: What aspect of the design most excites you? Uh, this is really an opportunity here for feedback. Uh, we're looking, you know, for input from uh, folks, you know, from yourselves um, um, to to really, you know, let us know what what. And here's a, a, a picture of the proposed design again. What's you know. What do you, what mostly excites you right now? What are you most excited about? And uh, one thing to note, if it's, yeah, if, if it's other, something that perhaps is not on that list, um, please write it in the chat here so that we can have it. Um, or perhaps it's uh, an aspect of design that isn't there right now, but perhaps it's something you're interested you, you're interested in. Please write in the chat. At the end of this, we're going to collect um, some of these answers, and as we continue uh, to work towards this uh, on this project, these are the kind of feedback uh, notes that'll uh, help us um, continue to uh, design uh, what what what's uh, of interest. So right now. We have a uh, you know increased ecological value as the the first the most uh, exciting. Then we have a kayak water stop, which it seems uh, to be next. Then pedestrian path, path osprey platform, uh, wildlife habitat, and fishing access. Uh, so thank you again. If you have anything that isn't on that list, please write it in the chat. Um, this uh, just as a um, and looking ahead, uh, we will, the LRWP will have this recording. Um, we will we'll have this hosted. We'll also, you know, please, re we'll receive comments if you uh, wish to email Heather or myself, um, or on our website, we have a blog post about this project. Um, and you can always comment and, you know, leave feedback there or share it with a friend. Uh, we'd love to hear more about uh, what folks think about this. So seeing no uh, additional things in the chat, yes, let's move on to the next one. Uh, so uh, again, is there another feature, design feature that you would like to see here? Um, this is more through the Menti in case you just didn't want to chat it. Um, this is, you can put it in here. Uh, one other thing, you know, some some of the things we've been thinking about is uh, about the site history. There is a lot of brick on the site. Uh, the LRWP has been, talking about uh, potentially utilizing some of the material on site uh, to, uh, you know, either create an art installation that pays homage to the history, not only of, of the municipality, the, the, the locate the municipalities, um, but also um, uh, be able to, you know, the, the industry that was bolstered by, by this region. Um, many of, some of you may be familiar or may not perhaps, uh, the LRWP also has uh, look for the river hashtag look for the river, and we have a frame uh, current a frame that was uh, is constructed, and I'll show we'll show a, a figure about that uh, later on. on um, but I just you know we have different ways of uh, utilizing material to create uh, to create art or something that is informational and really pays tribute to the site. So right now we're seeing bird blinds, some elevated platforms, again, perhaps for viewing purposes in the maritime forest, uh, uh, bridge to the maritime forest, uh, foot access across the tidal stream, utilizing SNF bricks. So uh, thank you, Citizen Science, Science Monitoring Station. Um, thank you all for those um, additions. Uh, again, we will be uh, looking for additional feedback as we move on through this process. Uh, please uh, feel free to contact Heather or myself at any time. So the next uh, the, the I project status uh, and some next steps here. So as uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, uh, this project kicked off in 2020. Uh, we had a state court. We we and here are all the design uh, the steps that we've uh, gone through along the way. 
And currently we're at that uh, February at the end right there towards the right, the 60% design and construction cost estimate, uh, estimate, which is completed. This is the end of this phase um, that has been funded through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Uh, so we're kind of in a really interesting spot here, right? We're finishing the 60% design and we wanna start moving uh, to you know, continue to shepherd this, pro this project um, uh, to the next phase. And ultimately, you know, we want to get to 100% design and then we want to um, get to uh, implementation. And uh, the, what we've recently, and just to give you guys a little bit of an update, we have recently submitted a follow-up application to the National Fish and Wildlife to carry out additional steps that will uh, bolster the project and, and get us to the next, to the next uh, uh, not to 100% completion, but to the next phase here to ready ourselves for a more complete engineering design down the road. Uh, so we've recently submitted that uh, just this past month, and we hope to, uh, you know, hear some um, hear whether we've got it or not uh, towards the towards the late spring, early summer. Um, please be on the lookout. Uh, LRWP will be sharing that via our blog, um, um, social media handles, um, and uh, uh, through our newsletters. So we'll 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 have more information at the end about that. Uh, so we're following that we will have a final report about this project thus far, and that will be released on June 1st. So again, uh, that will be really, we'll share that uh, LRWP will be sharing that via our newsletter. So if you uh, can please sign up, Heather, if you could uh, in, put in a, a link, uh, that'd be for folks that want to uh, just go in and check out our website. You can sign up for our newsletter there. We have a couple blog posts about this. Princeton Hydro also has a blog post about the, the project area that they, they put together. Uh, another update is we have a June 4th cleanup scheduled um, in the project area. So if you haven't been there yet, uh, this would be a really good opportunity for you to uh, come. Uh, I, if you've already uh, gone on cleanups with the LRWP, we'd love to have you again. But if it's your first one, uh, you can come and see what it's all about. And, uh, you know, we can uh, also uh, explore the, the project site a little bit together. Um, so please be on the, uh, on the uh, lookout for that as well. Uh, we have, um, so we have some, we we'll always have a need for volunteer time. Uh, whether it's, you know, through our water quality monitoring effort, which right now has been uh, along the Raritan. We have six state, I let Raritan remember, we have six stations currently that we're monitoring through spring and towards the, uh, towards the fall. Um, so uh, volunteer time all and, uh, you know, and last, um, you tell us, like, if there's a way that to help move this project forward, I know there's a number of folks that are either on the call or going to be seeing this recording. Uh, the LRWP is very interested in uh, seeing how, uh, you know, uh, various municipalities uh, and other nonprofits, governments um, can help uh, shepherd this project along. Uh, we are uh, very excited about this and hope that uh, others are as well. And one uh, other thing, so I mentioned earlier, art installations and pro our hashtag look for the river. On the right side, uh, the figure that you're seeing here is our current frame that is in Boyd Park in New Brunswick. Uh, you can go out there, see it, take your phone with you, take a photo, um, and use the hashtag when you upload it to Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, wherever you are. Uh, it's a way of us, we're trying to document um, different parts of the river. And uh, what we come up with is over the time, you can we can use the hashtag and actually look at different photos that have been taken over the past you know months years even and see how parts of the river transform so this is very much a an in, a way of engaging with uh with the space um the space around us uh next slide please and with that we will welcome any questions and closing room uh any questions comments that you might have uh, at this time uh if you want to put it in the chat, please uh, uh, submit it uh, there. If not, I believe uh, we can, is there like a hand raising or unmuting function for folks uh, in case you just want to, you know, speak instead? That works too. Yeah, folks can unmute themselves if they'd like, or they could also enter their, their questions or comments in the chat.
There's a question here, Johnny, um, about uh, you know, the, the how of creating the proposed new channel. Great. Well, I'm actually going to give that one to Christy. Thank you. Uh, Jessica, if you don't mind putting the, if you could put up the rendering um, so we can have a visual. Uh, you know, th there's really no secret to how we'll create it. It's sort of like the good old fashioned, get some heavy machinery and, and dig. Um, <laughs> and we have selected the lower elevations of the site. So the title path, you know, or, I'm sorry, the title channel where it first connects um, on the more southern extent is actually a low area inhabited by five mighties, um, but it's already at that low elevation. So we're taking advantage of the existing grades as much as we can. Um, and then as as the tidal channels is conveyed, um, again, we saw we followed some of the natural drainage paths on the site. Um, so excavation is sort of the short answer there. Any more questions? <laughs> Comments? Thanks, Heather. <laughs> yeah, do people think of questions or you know have comments later? Feel free to reach out to to Johnny and Heather, and we'll certainly keep you involved. And there, you know, we hope for there to be a lot more outreach as well as to to bring the community into this as well. Ooh, question. So, will access to the site be compromised during the spring? Is that a general, or you mean this spring? <laughs> um, so, really, we're talking you're... about bird migration. Okay. Oh, to like close it down during the spring. Hmm. So. Right now, I think some of these questions are all combined. So we'll be working, you know, we still have to go through the design, the rest of the design process uh, and the regulatory support. So the, I think we're, we're looking at a couple of years there um, and there will be timing restrictions because the site sits at sort of a, a vital nexus, both with fisheries and avian, you know, will very much be abiding by any kind of restrictions. Uh, I know, generally speaking, Typically, um, especially for sites that are used by avian species, we would be looking at a more of a winter start time before any nesting begins. Um, and, you know, in a project of this size, it's also going to be phased. Uh, you know, there isn't going to be a complete clearing of the site all at once. And so the goal would be that there would be some areas for refugia while, you know, there are other parts of, of the site construction. Uh, so Colin has a question. What is the land cover in the bottom left corner of the render? So the bottom left is Phragmites. Yeah, and it's sort of it's whited out because that's outside of our project area. Um, but if you look to the right, there's sort of that green area, green marsh, uh, which we haven't focused on and as much, but that is certainly part of the project area. Um, as Johnny said, a lot of the the marsh in this area is sort of compromised or invaded by Phragmites. So this this little piece um, would, would really be a pilot for the rest of the site where we can go in, treat the, the Phragmites, and then replant it with some native native species. There are different uh, additional questions here in terms of uh, timeline for completion um, and uh, um, uh, I'll just say, first of all, that the engineering engineer design isn't even yet complete, you know, so um, securing grant funds to wrap up that part of the project. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully engineer design uh, with fingers crossed, you know, maybe within the next year. Christiana, Johnny, yeah, you fingers know? crossed, um, you know, it's all going to be about funding. Uh, and getting that next phase, we, you know, we have a couple of future. We're waiting for grant announcements to come out, so we are prepared and ready. Uh, Johnny had mentioned in an, an application that we just submitted for NIFWIP. Um, it's sort of an interim step, 
And this sort of ties into the question about how the design interfaces with the neighborhood. Um, we'll be working with Sayerville in a little bit more um, coordination and there's people, you know, there's some properties along that area and talking about different opportunities uh, to, to improve that area and restore some of the floodplain benefit. Um, so that is what, you know, that, that additional funding that we're looking at will we'll look at that aspect in particular. Uh, so again, uh, when do you estimate the project to be completed? Uh, it's again, it's very hard to tell. We're very much in the design phase still. Uh, could take a while. There's, you know, hurdles ahead, uh, design, and also, you, you know, like Christy mentioned, uh, complying, you know, right with the regulatory permitting, all that stuff. So uh, it, before we get break ground, it, it could be a, it could be a bit, um, but we're hoping to continue to advance it. And this is part. Th this is the first big step, right? Getting the first design and getting you know getting this project on the map and on the board somewhere. Um, and so this is how that starts. So it's really hard, really, to to give um, an estimate on when it'll, it'll be completed. Yeah, and, then, and there was one last question about working with Sayerville and the municipality and, and, and absolutely they've been a part of this process um, since the beginning and involved you know, their, their noted project team member um, and will continue to be. Um, we will continue to work with them throughout this. Um, are you. Do you work with the resilient NJ project? So we have coordinated and have had uh, meetings in the past with uh, folks from the RN from our resilient New Jersey. Uh, we this is on the radar. This is also a project that has been uh, uh, submitted to the CRAP process. The so the state kind of identifying uh, areas of priority and areas of concern. Um, so yeah, we are we are reaching out to folks. We are keeping uh, folks aware and. As we come up with more updates, we will continue to update uh, folks as well. So, yes, Anton. We have we have another question. If, if everyone can stick and stick with us for a minute. Uh, so, how far is the kayak launch from the nearest parking area? This is a good question. The answer is far. <laughs> uh, in the original vision of the site, we wanted to include a kayak launch. Uh, that we you know people can park and bring their boat. Uh, the feasibility of that has been difficult to, particularly with the limitations of the tides. Uh, our biggest fear is that if we we have a kayak launch close to the parking lot, it likely would be in the tidal channel that will dry out uh, or dry up during low tide. And we do not want to create a dangerous situation for anyone that has launched to the site, um, which is ultimately why we. Have, you know, we've discussed it with various kayakers um, as well as some other organizations in the region. Um, and we felt like a kayak stop was a better and safer uh, feature. Um, so I don't know the exact uh, distance, but I, it's it's probably on this order of several hundred feet, uh, which it, it would be a long, it would be heavy and long to carry a kayak. <laughs> yeah. Me, anyway. we're, we're we're mostly thinking, uh, you know, that we, we know folks already launched like uh, in, off of uh, different parts on uh, the South River. So um, we know folks sometimes launch off Causeway Park in, in South River and some other locations throughout uh, the these waterways. So instead of uh, in having the, the launch within the project area itself, it'll be a kayak stop. So it'll be somewhere folks can, you know, stop, take a break and you know, maybe uh, uh, walk around or explore the project area. So we want to make it as like a highlight, a place to stop, but perhaps not a place to launch from. I think we'll you're maybe up on the questions. Yeah, I mean, it, again, uh, I'll give well, one last minute for any last questions or comments, uh, but want to definitely thank everyone for attending tonight and for uh, 
uh, being part of this uh, discussion. And we at um, the Lower Raritan Watershed Partnership definitely look forward to engaging with everyone as we progress uh, through this project. So please, if you haven't already, um, sign up. Um, I want to take some time to thank uh, all the panelists. Thank you, uh, Princeton Hydro, who uh, with uh, Christy, Dana, uh, Pat, uh, Dana, and uh, Jessica for uh, leading us through this process. Thank you to the county, Nick DeFaro, for uh, being up here and being able to talk um, and join us throughout the throughout really the since the beginning of this project. So thank you for that. Um, and also, uh, Commissioner Kenny has been an advocate of this project. You know, so big yeah. thanks to Middlesex County Commissioner Kenny. Um, and yeah. and Raritan Riverkeeper Bill Schultz is not uh, on, but he has also been a, a big supporter of this project. And the boroughs of Sayreville and South River, of course, thank you. Um, we have some really strong partnerships there as well. So uh, thank you all. And uh, with that, uh, We'll uh, let you hop off a few minutes early. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your Thursday night. Thanks everyone, bye. bye well, some of the panelists might stick around for, for a minute or so, but. <laughs>